Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, from George Minhawka, director of My Bloody Valentine. And you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. And keep your head on and watch our movie again. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I am Nasty Neal. This is Annabelle Lecter. Mm-hmm. And this is our special Valentine's Day special. And we're joined by Neil Affleck of the classic My Bloody Valentine. How you doing? How's it going? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Not too Welcome bad. to the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Yes, yes. How, Happy you know, Valentine's Day. I've been wondering this. When that movie came mm-hmm. out, how did that affect your Valentine's Day that year? Uh, well, you know, I was pretty young at the time, shall we say. I uh, I had a girlfriend in Montreal before we went to... Uh, went on location to um, the Maritimes, to Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, to shoot the film. We were there for two months. And uh, I returned home after two months, and I didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> so that's, oh. that's kind of what I remember. Whose choice but, was that? Because you could well, have been gone for two months and found some chicky, or was she like, I'm done? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, yeah. I was oh. pretty... Uh, I, I was pretty young and stupid then, as opposed to elderly and stupid, which I am right now. <laughs> but no, uh, my um, my amorous life did not take off in exciting new directions after the My Bloody Fa- My uh, Bloody Valentine film emerged. Yeah. I can mm-hmm. safely say that. Yeah, we was like to open the the, the interview with something uh, hurtful for the guest. That's good. Well, that works for me too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how did how did the role come about for my bloody Valentine? Well, uh, you know the the project itself was put together in Montreal by um, some filmmakers there and uh, at who had made a connection um, with uh, Paramount, I believe, in Hollywood. Uh, the concept of the, you know, this was the era, as I'm sure you guys know much better than I do. Uh, this was sort of um, a golden era of the slasher film, if you will, at mm-hmm. least in terms of the Canadian industry, um, possibly in the States too. Um, so there was very much a market for, or for, how shall I put it, uh, concept horror films like Muddy Bl- My Bloody Valentine certainly was. Some filmmakers in Montreal uh, put together the concept, put together the idea of a horror film set in uh, underground in a mine and um, they sold uh, some folks at, uh, as I say, at Paramount in LA on it and the rest is history uh, in terms of getting the project going and funded and uh, I came into it, um, geez, I don't know, I can't re- I think it would have been the summer of 80, 1980 or 79, um, and uh, was a, essentially just received a cold call from uh, the company to come in and read for the role. I'd just been fired, been booted off another film um, in Canada, in Toronto, literally what weeks did you do? before. Uh, I did a very bad acting job. <laughs> <really>. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> well, what happened? It's it's a long story, and it, it's not really that germane to our discussion tonight. Uh, other than to observe, I was a very young, in- inexperienced um, actor in front of the camera at the time. I got given a, a rather good, meaty, challenging role in a uh, another film, not a horror film. And I sort of came apart at the seams. I wasn't ready for, there was a whole bunch of things, but it was a bit of a... It wasn't here like hanging out in the mall for scanners. Pardon me? Oh, it was fun. That was just a day's work, eh? <laughs> uh, um, that, was, uh, uh, that was really just a day's work for me. And it's nice having that on, on one's resume that you worked for David Cronenberg. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I remember him as being very quiet, very kind of meticulous, um, soft-spoken guy. And, you know, I was just there for for a day hanging out. And But an interesting thing is after the fact, um, 
I found out, I mean, the way my, my, my character role was written is young doctor or student doctor, young mm-hmm. doctor, I guess. And I, I found out afterwards something I, I wasn't aware of that actually David Cronenberg had been a, a medical student himself. So um, prior to uh, becoming a filmmaker. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. It was fun. It was day's work, as I say. Um, and uh, I guess I haven't seen that film in a long, long time. Hmm. But it's still out there, I guess. Yeah, so. we actually just saw it recently. Uh, I was playing. Really? Uh, it was yeah. a midnight movie here at uh, one of our local theaters. Oh, okay. So. All right. So it's still out there making bacon. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Nope. We recently had uh, Ray Sager on the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he kind of. He mentioned that he did uh, a lot of the editing on My Buddy Valentine. and kind of mentioned that he kind of did more than George Michalka did, who's credited as the director. Do you have anything, uh, any recollection of this? I'm not going to wade into any areas of controversy. <laughs> okay, all right. Fair enough. For the very good reason that I, I, I wouldn't be able to give any kind of an informed uh, opinion on that. Um, uh, anybody who's worked in film knows, uh, you know, feature filmmaking in particular. Strangely enough, uh, actors are a very small part of the actual filmmaking picture. Um, you know, you you show up, you you do, you try not, as the saying goes, you try not to to uh, crash into the furniture. You try to remember your lines and hit your points and and try and give as strong a performance as you can. Uh, and at the end of the day, you you stroll away, and the filmmakers, the crew, and the especially the directors and everything like that work on into the wee hours, day after day, <laughs> week after week, well into post production at a point when the actors are, are long gone from the picture. So, simply put, that's a long-winded response to uh, saying that I really would not know uh, anything. I do know that Ray, um, I worked for Ray uh, in the latter part of um, uh, of our production period in, in Cape Breton uh, when he became a second unit to director for us. Um, when we were trying, scrambling to uh, to finish up production, and I enjoyed working with Ray, He's a bright guy, and he he's been an actor himself, so he uh, um, that informed uh, his way of working, and mm. uh, and I've seen him a few times since then. He's uh, he's sort of a busy guy. He's got some projects on the go himself. So yeah, yeah, yeah. which people can check out. Uh, we talked about it on a previous interview. Two plug for ourselves. Uh, plug for Ray. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now, yeah. uh, filming in the mines themselves, uh, yeah. for you, do you think that helped like, uh, get into the scenes, or well, was it hard? What was it like? Uh, it was interesting. I, I mean, it was, I still have some very powerful memories of, um, of the work working underground, and also the whole... Um, if you will, the whole mood and the feeling of of mining communities and mining people, because we were working in a a mine museum and we were working in a, a you know in Cape Breton is is a mining community. The Prince uh, Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, is a mine formerly a mining community. It's a whole way of life that's disappeared right now, but it was best I recall, at least 100 years old when we were down there, um, the process, the actual physical process of working underground was uh, was uh, rather taxing because the entire crew, uh, the entire cast and extras, um, you know, the whole unit, as it were, would have to be transported down to the pithead area on a single, via a single... Um, um, Elevator, or that's not the right term, but and that took quite a while. So that's how your day would start with uh, everybody being shuttled to the bottom. Um, there was a, you know, you know I, 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 I'd have to say that, um, you know, our our performances of the cast couldn't help but uh, be influenced by the fact that we were working in this sort of mysterious, strangely. Um, 
enticing, I guess is the way I'd say, uh, environment of underground. Um, and of course, we were in contact with the people of the of the community too. Um, and uh, as I've said before, I, I met some very, very remarkable people, men and women down there, uh, men who'd worked underground for years as coal miners and uh, the women, their, their family members and stuff. Um, they're special people, mining people. And um, uh, to me, that was, uh, I think, even more of a – had even more of an impact than actually – working underground it was the people i met and um the you know the week before we actually st actually started uh, filming um the company sent us down in a working coal mine called the 22nd colliery in glace bay nova scotia which i think uh, well it's it's closed its uh, operations a long time ago now 15 years um and that was an actual experience going all the way all the way down and meeting meeting working miners so that is what I remember in terms of just getting a sense of of what the what it was like to go every day, you know, a mile or two underground, three four miles out under the sea, and uh, work for a living doing that work. Um, you know, I, I in terms of how <laughs> how convincing we were as miners, I'll leave that up for other people to judge. Um, you know, those of us in the cast were, you know, basically middle class acting guys from mm -hmm. from Montreal and Toronto. So, uh, you know, I, I, we came at the whole uh, mining experience um, uh, not naturally. I would say we we mm -hmm. it was something. The one cast member who I think nailed it, and I'll say I, I'm, I'm repeating myself. I said this before was Keith Knight who played. Um, boy, what's the name of the character he played again? The big guy with the walrus mustache. Yeah, he passed away not mm -hmm. too long ago, I believe. Yeah, we lost Keith about five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think Keith was the one amongst us who really nailed that kind of working class thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he just seemed to exude it. And whenever I've watched the film after all these years, he's the one performance that I think um, is top notch. Uh, Rest of us are able to watch. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I the rest of you are, but he, he is. He's a really fun character. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did they receive you in the town? Just like you said, you guys are coming in. You're doing movies, and here are these, you know, real miners. Did they were they cool with you being there? Did it take some warming up? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it was quite something for a film unit to descend on. Um, on a uh, a small town, really, in, in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Just to give you a bit of context, um, Cape Breton is, uh, is an area of, of Atlantic Canada that's culturally, it's a little bit unique. It's, there's some people who still speak uh, Scottish Gaelic there. Um, oh, wow. it's, it's a um, you know, pretty, pretty rough-hewn area. Um, very folksy, uh, people are wonderful people there, um, as all Maritimers are. Um, but it's, you know, it's got a bit of an edge to it. If, if you think in terms of parts of West Virginia, Appalachia, um, mm -hmm. which not surprisingly is another area where, where folks, uh, work, uh, work the coal for a living or used to, um, it might give you a bit of a sense of, of a little bit where Cape Bretoners are coming from. Um, I uh, about a, a fight that happened one night. You guys were there. Wasn't there like a brawl outside? Oh yeah, between yeah, some oh. of them. Well, not between you guys, I don't think, but between no. between themselves. No, I I, uh, I managed to avoid any of the extracurricular fisticuffs. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> the the hotel we were at was in downtown Sydney Mines. I remember one night that. Um, um, the uh, some uh, arguments uh, that occurred in the bar spilled out into the street and uh, were settled the way <laughs> such disputes are frequently settled in in Cape Breton mm -hmm. with the boys going at it. It wasn't anything I uh, had any part of or participated in. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I was already at that stage a retired drinker, so I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't much in evidence at the bar. <laughs> so, mm. but uh, no, they're uh, they're rough and ready guys, the, the lads from Cape Breton, that's for sure. And um, uh, I I do remember that that was uh, uh, something that could transpire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's not a place most of us would necessarily want to go hang out in. Uh, on Not the like contrary, well, location. no, no, on the contrary, I, uh, as a good uh, patriotic Canadian in, in encouraging Atlantic tourism, I would strongly advise you to visit Cape Breton. It's a very beautiful part of the world, uh, on top of everything else. I don't want to create the impression that it's uh, primeval or anything. It's, uh, you know, it's, and my, my partner, uh, Lynn, was just down there for a music festival and uh, Cape Breton and uh, this fall. And, um, and in fact, uh, a lot of the finest, uh, most original uh, music um, in Canadian music, popular music, has come out of Cape Breton in the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, yeah, it was just, so they probably come I, I a long should, way I in about be, 30 or so years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, speaking of music, I actually mm-hmm. I totally love the, uh, the the closing song, the the, the ballad yeah. of, of uh, Harry Warden. And yeah. uh, I, did you? When was the first time you heard that? Would it have been like the first time you saw the finished film? Uh, exactly. I hadn't. Um, I hadn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, something that we heard there. I think it was commissioned. Uh, you'll have to help me with the composer's name again. Yeah, I think he's that- in the specials. I know. Yeah, um, I, I think they commissioned that uh, George, the director. I, I may have this wrong, but I, I think they decided at some point when they were in post, um, nearing conclusion, that they needed some sort of ballad or uh, something that evoked a kind of mythology or a folk kind of um, something with a folk idiom to it, and that. Mm-hmm. They went looking for um, somebody to come up with, uh, with, and the song was the result. You know, it's uh, I play a bit of folk music myself. I, I think it's a good, strong song. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, and it does give a sort of um, a twist to the finish of the the film too. That uh, mm-hmm. that helps. So yeah, my my two cents. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, I don't know how how where were you that they edited down a lot of the kill scenes because I don't know if you uh, you know being uh, an actor in the film as, as you know instead of the director or whatever if you were aware that they cut they cut them down oh well uh, you know a uh, bit of context here this was nowadays with special effects of course and uh, be they gore or be they decapitation or any of uh, the other um, uh, sort of uh, uh, mayhem associated with horror films. Almost all, that's almost always done with digital effects right now, as you guys are probably, mm-hmm. as most of your viewers or listeners are probably aware. Um, this was pre-digital, obviously. We're talking 1980, 81, 79, 80, 81. Um, and uh, so they had a, two, two special effects guys from L.A. working on the film uh, who were doing a pretty good job. But the whole issue of how of, of how gruesome they were going and how they would have to cut it back uh, was not something that we were aware of on a day to day basis when we were shooting the film. At least not not me anyway. Uh, perhaps some of the other people were. I know it was a big issue, of course, for George mahalka the director also rodney mm-hmm. gibbons uh the very talented dop of the film who uh, really deserves a lot of credit for for the the kind of the the look that the film has which has which has weathered very well over the years um and I, obviously the producers were involved in that too um again you know <laughs> as actors we were a bit insulated from all that stuff i do know just you know um in ter- anecdotally, as it were, that it became a huge issue when they were posting it, and uh, they were in a mad rush to to meet their re- release dates, and the whole issue of what kind of um, 
category they were going to release it in. So uh, essentially, my understanding is they really had their feet held to the fire and say, no, you got to tone this down. It's too graphic. It's too gruesome. And um, it wouldn't be like rated X. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. Yeah, that was yeah. what I was looking for. So if they wanted to have that, they simply put were more or less given their marching orders and uh, they had to kind of tone it down. I know they've, there's been a um, uh, full frontal graphic version has been released. Yeah, just recently, the- actually. <laughs> On the, uh, the, Excuse me. Yeah, it's uh, the collector's edition. Uh, actually, yeah. we, I, we did an interview with George um, like, about five or six years ago it was actually okay. right around that time when that actor had passed away. And, yeah. um, and at the time he was hoping that they would eventually put out the uncut one. Right. And actually during that interview, which w- was odd, we brought up that they were remaking the movie and he hadn't even known about it. And it was like kind of broke the news to him who directed the original movie that they were remaking it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I can only – all I can say by response to that is I was astounded when I – two things. I was astonished to learn um, that My Bloody Valentine was considered a cult classic or as it's been told. When I learned about it, I was completely uh, dumbfounded when I heard that they were remaking it. I, I – the the idea that someone would remake the film was astonishing to me. I uh, You need to understand that after I finished My Bloody Valentine, I worked for maybe a couple more years as an actor with, safe to say, a limited amount of ex- success or exposure, mostly in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, kind of packed it in for acting and I went to film school in UCLA in California and ended up working – in animated film for, well, I've worked in it for upwards of a quarter century, 25 years. So during the period that the film was, I guess, becoming the cult classic that people say it is, I I was completely, it wasn't so much that I was unaware of it, it just never occurred to me. Uh, I mean, the only kind of uh, experience I had with it, I guess you could say, is when I was at UCLA studying film, uh, my fellow students there learned that I'd been a film actor in Canada and they signed me up to work on their student projects, which I was happy to do because it was sort of like a skills exchange thing where somebody would work as a DOP, somebody would work as a director, somebody, you know, so I, I can, did some work as an actor for uh, – my fellow students down there, and they and they heard, had heard about the film. But to bring it all back home, like George, I was astounded when I heard somebody was remaking it. And then sometime, I would say about the time you folks would have spoken to him, uh, a horror society in Toronto uh, set up a screening in Toronto of the original film, invited George to come out and uh, invited uh, the Toronto-based cast members to come out, which we did, sort of on a lark. And um, again, the only term I could come up with was we were amazed that the, at the turnout, at the response of um, that people came, some people, some folks came up for the evening, as it were, all the way from Pennsylvania <laughs> to Toronto for the screening, which... Uh, you know, it's a long way to go for for yeah. co- a long way to go for warm beer. Uh, so, um, you know, the fact that the film had—I'll just say it again—the fact that the film had become within the genre um, so well known and celebrated was something that I was completely oblivious to for years. So, it's all been a bit fun, actually. Uh, um, you know, getting to do what? stuff like we're doing right yeah. now. And also the cast members um, of the film, we've gone to a few conventions since then, and it's nice getting together. You know, everybody's uh, pretty creaky and doddering at this point. We're all smart-ass <laughs> punk kids when we shot the film, uh-huh. and we're now uh, well into our dotage. But everybody sort of stays in touch, um, at least within... within uh, Toronto and Ontario, uh, a few people, well, of course, as we say, we lost Keith, but 
most folks were around and about. So that's been a real pleasant surprise sort of after all these years. Uh, for the folks who stayed in acting, you know, the, the, and even for me, uh, the film was just a gig, you know, it's just a gig to do. So, so I guess you never know, right? Did you, know, did you I'm sorry. stay in touch from the film on or once the convention started to happen and you were in touch with each other? Yeah, I, it was really actually... Um, it was the fact that they were redoing the film, remounting the, or doing a remake of the film. And then there was the evening in Toronto I described mm -hmm. that sort of encouraged everybody to, to – and then everybody got invited to a convention in, in New Jersey. Uh, that's what really inspired everybody getting back together again. I, you know, I've been off and on in contact with a few people over the years with Al Humphreys, with Laurie. Hallier, um, uh, Jim Murkison, who played uh, Jimmy, what's his name? Anyway, one of the roles is an old buddy of mine <laughs> and, and stuff. So, the, you know, but everybody has lives. You know, we'd all have lives. We, we had families. We had stuff going on. People like me, a few other people had gotten into different lines and stuff. So it was, um, it was sort of a casual, um, casual staying in touch but uh, as I say the, the events of about five years ago sort of have uh, <laughs> conspired to inspire us to, yeah. to, mm -hmm. to stay, yeah. stay closer touch. When we started you know you mentioned yeah. 1981 being like uh, yeah. around that time and it would, it would have been like an era when a lot of these kind of movies came out Yeah. what is it about, uh, about My Bloody Valentine do you think that people still you remember it and new people discover it because there's a lot of movies that came yeah. out that come and go and not, you know, might not still sure. be remembered. Well, uh, let me just say off. I, I, I'm I'm willing to offer my own opinions for what they're worth, but I'd also be interested in hearing from you guys on that. Okay. Since you know, um, for me, I I think uh, in retrospect, I think it was a it was a very cool idea to shoot in a mine. I don't think it had been done before. Um, certainly not perhaps mm -hmm. uh, documentaries had been shot in mines but uh, certainly not a, a theatrical uh, nor a genre a horror genre film had, so I think the original idea was was quite um, it was a certain amount of, uh, highly original brilliant and um, and bold audacious as it were I think the script was pretty good you know within uh, within mm -hmm. the the generic terms of the thing. I think a decision that uh, that George Mahalka, the director, and Rodney, uh, the DOP, Rodney Gibbons, the DOP, made um, early on, and I suspect they, they also got some support from uh, the producing end of things, to go for a working class feel for the story, you know, most of the, pardon the expression, slasher pictures up to then sort of featured middle-class suburban uh, kids, mm -hmm. you know, um, being chased around by scary guys in, ma in hockey masks and stuff. And, um, you know, George and Rodney decided they wanted to go for a gritty working class feel. And that may, I think that made a little bit that, that, shaded it a little bit more differently than I, I certainly, you know, I'm not that knowledgeable about the other horror films that were coming out at the time, but I do know that Bloody Valentine was going for a working class vibe. And to the extent it succeeded, I think that set it apart um, from some of the other, uh, from some of the other uh, horror, horror pictures that were coming out at the time. I think it was very, very well done. The special mm -hmm. effects, the, you know, I mean, uh, horror films are thrill rides, aren't they, in some ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's about working on getting a visceral reaction from the viewers and by any means necessary, any legal means necessary. <laughs> and I think uh, I think they generally succeed in that quite often. Um, uh, over to you guys. What do you think? Uh, how would uh, how would you qualify? Uh, what would you say was the defining features of the film? I well, it's funny you mentioned the thrill ride because that was part of what I was 
you were talking, I thought, well, that that is a huge part of it. I, there's an adventure sense to the film. The, the yeah. idea of you're going into the mind. It's something that's foreign to almost everyone. No one really has that experience unless you're in that town. Right. So there's right. that whole element of discovering something new. You're in the dark. Those, you know, normal, scary things. You're underground. That's stuff that just would bother people in general anyways because you're outside of your environment. I think that you guys really pulled off the chemistry, all these kids together. It felt very believable. The relationship felt believable. It was, you know, you you all did a very good job portraying that and really having that feeling of you guys working down there and the whole thing was excellent. Mm-hmm. And I think you also had a great villain where it, it there's more of those elements that just at a very base level frighten people. You have this killer he doesn't talk. Mm-hmm. You can't see his face. He has quasi mysterious origin where he was disapp- he'd gone for so long and they didn't know he's supposed to be in the facility. Now he's not. Well, where was he? And so there are all these different factors that I think are necessary. The core factors that would bother a human at a very basic level, but it was a unique story. It was told in a different way. Like you mentioned the suburbia. And so it gave it, you know, that difference. A lot of the kills are kind of silly, to be honest, but that's part of the fun, too, is a lot of the horror people, they enjoy that. You've got that feeling I, of dread. I, I love going the kills, on, But at yeah. the same time, you've got these silly things, like you, he mounted uh, a person so that a sprinkler was coming out of their mouth. Things like that. Mm-hmm. Well, gross, think, yeah. but funny. And I think that all those things together, it's just, it's an enjoyable yeah. experience. I, I'd watch watching. this movie many times when I, when I was uh, growing up. Yeah, they show it every year around Valentine's Day on Channel 38. I watch it every year. Mm. And uh, for me, I think the kills are a lot of fun. Um, uh, they're, they're great. And the uh, really the visual of the um, of the killer himself, just right. with the gas mask and the axe, which I don't think a pickaxe has really been used in, in other films, and mm. uh, being set in Valentine's Day, because I don't think any mm. other movie was. And I still think definitely the look of the movie is still... It holds yeah. up and being underground like Annabelle mentioned. Well, in terms of the the, the killer, the the icon that that iconographic minor killer, um, giving credit where credit is due, I, I think uh, my buddy Peter Cowper did an amazing job um, portraying that character. Um, I am sometimes given credit because my character was revealed as the killer in the. In the final final frames of the, the <laughs> of the picture, sometimes uh, people mistakenly give me credit for portraying that character. I had nothing to do with that. That was Peter, Peter Cowper was a Montreal actor um, who was hired specifically to play the killer. Um, Peter, very graceful guy, trained dancer, wonderful natural mm-hmm. mime. Um, I uh, you know I think. It, it, there is something very effective or very um, – well, it's a, it's a, he's a scary guy, that character, because so much of uh, – so much – you think you understand what he's about, but so much is hidden. And um, credit where credit is due. I, I think uh, you know Peter gave, gave the filmmaker so much more to work with uh, in terms of his performance than I think they were, they, they'd anticipated. I think they were looking for somebody who could <coughs> stand there, look, a, look mean and, and, and throw around a pickaxe <laughs> with authority. But really uh, Peter gave them though, a lot more. Um, I was having a conversation actually earlier today, uh, mm-hmm. talking about this beforehand, that I think a lot of people don't appreciate that it takes so much to do that kind of role because he's mm-hmm. not able to talk. And it's, it's very limited in a certain way. And uh, Neil yeah. and I had looked over a movie several months ago now where there was a, actually it was a killer that had was a, very a similar mask, gas mask, mask very and, similar. It, yeah. and he just, he just didn't have that. It was, you know, it was an independent, it was kind of like mm-hmm. a homegrown sort of thing. And mm-hmm. the guy just didn't have that. And it made me really appreciate how much, that that person has to be able to do that they yeah. have to, really have to have a mastery of the movements in their body to be able to be yeah. convincing. Yeah. Well, Peter delivered, that's for sure. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it would not have been, uh, 
I think it's safe to say the movie would, would not have attained the kind of um, status it has or uh, staying power over the years without his performance. Yeah. I think that's stating the obvious. So, Did you really play uh, Mumble the Pig in the film? <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to do it. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I would do it with a pencil with a nice, safe little, little – <laughs> I practiced it with a pencil with a nice, safe uh, eraser end. Um, no, uh, that was uh, a cast of my hand, um, the one on the table um, where we're all going at it there. So when I, when I poke myself with my uh, pen knife or with my <laughs> hunting knife, whatever it is, it's, it's – uh, <sighs> It's just rubber stuff, not my not my real epidermis. So yeah, yeah. that was a fun scene to do. Mm -hmm. You know the uh, the bar any, scene. I'm sorry. Was, it's okay. Was there any serious thought to there perhaps being a sequel to this? Because I do believe around that time that was starting. Yeah. to happen. And, and they they keep the killer alive. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the movie was designed for a comeback, wasn't it? The way it was written. Mm -hmm. I heard various things over the years that they were trying to remount a uh, a sequel to it. Um, same company in Montreal, Astral. Um, but um, for one reason or another, um, nothing came of it. Um, mm -hmm. Probably George might be able to to tell you what what happened with that i don't know you know it's so hard I, I i i'm at the point now where i'm trying to get some projects going myself uh and um just sort of like a neophyte in the woods here innocent in the woods stumbling around it's so hard to get anything financed and produced nowadays and that was probably uh not much different uh, about 30 years ago so um so it didn't happen and you know at point it would have happened i'd already moved on to other things so um it uh i was probably i i just heard some vague you know mm -hmm. rumors that maybe they were thinking of doing a, uh, a sequel yeah you mentioned uh, your current projects uh would you like to yeah. talk about like what you've been doing currently well uh sure a little bit um you know as i said um after my acting career lasted about three years in montreal three years in toronto um, Bloody Valentine was the one uh, feature film role that I did during that time. I uh, did theater in Toronto and this, that, and the other, television, you know, the whole, the whole young actor thing. And then got a little bit fed up and frustrated with it, went to film school um, in California. I ended up, uh, I went to California for three years, ended up staying 15. And... Uh, for one reason or another, um, uh, kind of drifted into the animation field and I ended up working with The Simpsons during their heyday for 10 seasons, which was uh, a whole lot of fun. Yeah. Just real quick, uh, needless when you say, to say. When you say so. animation scene, uh, when you say yeah. drifting the animation scene, you weren't an animator. You were a director on the animation? Uh, well, I started as an animator animation? director oh, okay. doing uh, documentaries and uh, a little animated documentary. Huh. Then took a production job on on uh, on The Simpsons as an assistant director in the third season. A friend of mine, uh, Maria, Maria Rodriguez, was... Um, uh, production manager then this is a friend of mine from UCLA so uh, a lot of people I knew from the UCLA animation program ended up on the show over the years so it was just uh, timing and you know so much of what happens in this business is, is sort of being in the right place at the right time but I ended up uh, working for about 10 seasons on The Simpsons about five or six as an assistant director and then uh, Eventually, I got to direct about seven episodes, and um, it's what? a long time ago now, but it was uh, it was the heyday of the show, so um, a lot of fun. Uh, I got to work with some incredibly talented people uh, and uh, learn from them, so, um, you know, at, uh, I really... I look back on it now and scratch my head and say, boy, for a schmo from Montreal, you sure were lucky. <laughs> so, so anyway. That's a huge jump going from acting into yeah. animation. Well, I'd actually, I I'd actually, well, I'd actually worked in animation when I was a kid, like we're talking 15, 16, 
in Montreal. So the an animation actually preceded the acting. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I've wandered a bit afield. Uh, what I'm up to right now, uh, I'm still sort of have one foot in the... Uh, in the animation biz, but I've also um, started acting again after 30 years, uh, uh, just on kind of a low-key character acting uh, proposition here in Toronto. Um, I've worked on a sitcom. I worked on recently on a, um, a docudrama about uh, a polar expedition called the Franklin Expedition, well known in Canadian history because 140 guys <laughs> perished <laughs> trying to find the Northwest Passage. And I'm, uh, to be frank, guys, I'm having the time of my life. I hadn't worked as an actor in 30 years and um, really not since a year or two after Valentine. And I'm just enjoying it. I'm having the time of my life just rediscovering what it was that got me excited about uh, about the work, about the craft when I was a kid. And, um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm not sure uh, what will happen from here, uh, whether I can actually make a go of it as a, but, you know, I'm at this stage of the game, I'm, I'm looking at character roles. I'm looking at, um, uh, which to be frank is, is my favorite kind of, uh, that is the kind of role I prefer. Sort of give me a character that I can really sink my teeth into, and so I'm doing that. I'm also writing. I have, uh, and I'm trying to get some projects going and trying to educate myself in the <laughs> in the whole process of becoming an independent. Uh, trying to get in, uh, independent projects financed and done and stuff. It's uh, uh, so far, the uh, the results have been <laughs> middling at best, but I keep going. You know, I, there's a lot I need to learn about that whole thing. But um, moving forward, I think that's that's kind of uh, where I I hope to see myself uh, doing more acting and also getting some projects going. I should point out that. Um, the projects I'm interested in are about as far afield from uh, the horror genre. Uh -huh. I was going to ask one. what kind of genre. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. yeah, no, uh, one of them is is uh, you know a Canadian historical project, um, which is an uphill battle just on the pro simple proposition that most people in Canada feel Canadian history is boring, dull, and uh, and yawn inducing. I happen to disagree with that <laughs> proposition, but uh, it sometimes feels like you're you're uh, screaming in the wilderness. Um, the other project is a more perhaps uh, how shall I say more conventional um, comedy uh, formatted thing. So, so I'm new to it's something that I knew I'm new to, but um, you know I'm trying to trying to learn every day. And, uh, what inspired you to take all of this on? Uh, I have bills to pay. <laughs> 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 I've got a daughter in university, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, my my daughter's eighteen. She just started university, so I have bills to pay. I've got a nut to meet, and um, animation has. Uh, I, I worked in it for years and years, and was very very lucky. Uh, in terms of having steady work within the field. That's kind of been disappearing. Uh, animation is, uh, without going into a long song and dance, animation, uh, commercial animation is not in a good way currently. Um, Isn't a lot of animation being outsourced? Yeah. Yeah, it's being outsourced to death, if you want to know the truth. Um, yeah. as, uh, so, as is the case with so many other uh, professions and vocations in our society currently, um, things are being cut to the bone uh, because of the pressure of corporate, uh, corporate greed. Let's call it what it is, corporate greed, which seems to run uh, – uh, call the tune currently in our society. It's not likely to change anytime soon until people start getting together and doing something about it. Um, but um, it, just in terms of animation, so many of the crafts and the 
the work that were associated over the years have simply disappeared. People don't want to pay for it. Most producers <coughs> are working, yeah. are expected to create miracles with um, cut to the bone budgets. It's the same. Look, this is, it's not any different than any other, uh, so many other um, uh, vocations in the world. But, uh, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I've seen 30 years of it now, and it's a bit of a depressing prospect. Part of it, you know, I, I have to qualify that with, you know, I'm an old fart. And a, a bit of, I was a curmudgeon when I was a young man. So at this point of the game, I'm, I'm, I'm not just a curmudgeon, but I'm an old curmudgeon, which is the worst curmudgeon there is, kind of curmudgeon there is. So I look back on it and just sort of whine and complain. But ah, it's not like it used to be when I was young. You know, they don't know what to do. You notice though. There's a lot of things, including the shows that you, you know, The Simpsons, I think. Uh, other shows, I mean, I grew up and watched a lot of cartoons, and yeah. I draw, and I drew a lot of cartoons. And okay. you can, you can tell the difference from the earlier stuff, and then it looks mass-produced eventually. It looks like people are just banging this stuff out. It's not made. Yeah. Well, I mean... Well, let me let me say this. Uh, you know, uh, one of the barometers of a healthy industry is that young people coming up find footholds in it quickly and are able to contribute to it effectively and passionately. Uh, we're talking about artistic um, propositions here, even if they're commercial or whatever. In this case, we're talking animation, right? Uh, there's so few startup jobs for, for young people in animation right now that it's fucking criminal. There you are. There's your first <laughs> F-bomb from me. Um, but, uh, you, you know, uh, and I've done a little bit of teaching myself in, in, at CalArts in, in uh, L.A. and uh, Seneca College here in Toronto. There's so, so many young people go into animation and they're filled with um, – uh, creativity and they're filled with passion and they're filled with wonderful ideas that they want to get out and do. There's so few entry. That's the worst of it. The, the downsizing I described earlier, the worst of it really. It's not that, you know, old, old farts like me can't find work. The worst of it is that there, there aren't strong entry level jobs or or th there aren't the amount of strong entry level jobs for the young men and women who are coming out who should be streaming into animation and injecting it with with their energy and their enthusiasm um kids get offered or young people get offered you know four month contract here there on a project and it's a scramble I, whereas when I was starting out, I mean, I, I had a job with benefits for 12 years in Toronto. Prior to that, I was on The Simpsons, or, you know, which was more or less steady work. That doesn't really exist. I, I mean, occasionally somebody will get lucky, but there isn't that kind of um, – that situation doesn't obtain anymore. And I think it's, yeah. it's pretty uh, – look, the – you know, the three directors, we were talking about The Simpsons earlier, just to give it a bit of context, the three guys, the three startup directors on The Simpsons, um, Wes Archer, Dave, Simps uh, Dave Silverman, and Rich Moore, um, and I worked for all three of them. I was fortunate to work with all three of them. When they started The Simpsons... They were 23 years old when they started directing on The Simpsons. The average age. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they were kids. They were kids. Yeah. And look what they did. Okay, now granted, they were very talented people. They came out of good schools, yada, 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 whatever. The important thing is the opportunity was there. And I'm looking around right now and I'm seeing, yeah, you know, there's just, I, it will come. I mean, I, I, I hope and pray it will come. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I've spent most of my professional life in animation. I love it. I believe in it. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm just so bummed out about, I look around right now and, um, you know, I just, uh, I don't see the, the kind of, <clears throat> I don't see the infusion of energy and ideas and, and, and passion finding root 
in the trade right now because they're just it, it, it isn't it isn't providing the room for the folks for the young people coming out. I say that as somebody who's taught too. So I wish I could be more I, positive about things. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Annabelle. No, I was gonna I was gonna maybe hopefully be positive. Hopefully not too naive. But I know I don't know what it's like uh, in that particular world. But I know in the horror community. There's more and more and more independence, and you mentioned yeah. that there's a lot of computer-generated stuff. But people are now the audiences are starting to demand practical effects. That's yeah. now been a huge turnaround where people want to use prompts. They yeah. want to see makeup artists, things like that. And I don't think that there's a lot of money coming out of that at this point. But it seems, you know, once something like that catches on, then the people that are making a lot of money, then they have to hire the people that can do those jobs. So hopefully there'll be the same kind of demand for animation at some level that will then, you know, kind of snowball into more and more and more. It's just got to be a lot of people willing to do it for nothing. Well... Yeah, the whole willing to do it for nothing thing is uh, brings up another whole issue, which we don't have have time to get into <laughs> today. Uh, but, yeah, well, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, like I say, I, 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 I do have high hopes. I, I shouldn't. I, I hope I haven't sounded too pessimistic. Um, a tone. Uh, I think, you know, obviously a, there's a lot of energy happening online in terms of animation. And nowadays, too, uh, everybody can, uh, anybody virtually can create a film in their own, uh, on their own computer at home with, with all the programs available, this, that, and the other. So the, there's, there are some very hopeful signs. I'm just, every day I get up <laughs> hoping that... Uh, <laughs> that the next great wave of animation renaissance will wash over me. And uh, each, <laughs> at the end of every day, I'm a little bit disappointed. Well, damn, it didn't fucking happen today either. So, But, uh, but you know, it will. Yeah. I, I think we'll, we'll all be surprised by it. So, I, I would like to know, uh, yeah. was there a particular cartoon or series of cartoons that uh, made you want to get into animation? Uh, my background, I, I'm from Montreal. I'm a Quebecer. Uh, I'm from Montreal. Uh, my, you know, like other North Americans, uh, English, my first language, I watched Walt Disney when I was a kid and saw the films and stuff like that. So I had some exposure. I was not particularly enamored of Walt Disney when I was a kid. My uh, first exposure to actually creating animation was when I was 15 or 16. Um, my first heroes of it were from the National Film Board of Canada. Um, independent filmmakers, Norman McLaren. Um, this was a public institution in Canada that had a, uh, it's been besieged for years now. Um, <coughs> but it had a mandate to create films uh, about Canada that would um, represent the country. It had an incredibly strong animation unit back in those days. And I ended up working there as a, uh, as an apprentice, uh, stagiaire, as they say in French. It just means apprentice um, for two summers. That was my, They were my first, uh, Norman McLaren, Ryan Larkin, I'm um, mentioning Eve Lambert. These are just names that come back to me. Uh, they were independent filmmakers who worked on their own little atelier films within the framework of the film board. That's what inspired me. That's what got me interested and excited in, about animation. My appreciation of Disney... Um, Warner Brothers, the the kind of classics of American cartooning came later um, when I was exposed. You know, I'd seen them on television and stuff, but in terms of appreciating the craft uh, uh, of with which they were made, the 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 humor, the um, the skills, and you know, appreciating Disney's genius as a storyteller, all of that came later. Um, for me, anyway, um, my uh, as I said, my my template of uh, an animated filmmaker back in the day was the good old National Film Board of Canada. So, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, what was that? I'm a big fan of Tex Avery. I love style. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
we want to uh, thank you for being on our Valentine's Day special. Okay. It's been great to talk to you. All righty. Yeah. I've enjoyed yeah. it too. Thanks, guys. Thanks for letting me <laughs> <laughs> ramble and I ramble on. And uh, thanks, and I appreciate your um, patience with my pontifications and stuff like that. Uh, I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, well. What are you going to do? We enjoy it. We just what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? You give a guy a microphone and yeah. he's going to say this stuff. <laughs> Believe me, it's much better than when someone comes on and you ask a question and they say, yep. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then that's, that, that's the end of their answer. Experience. Yes, I have. Well, yeah. No. Yep. You will never get that with me, Neil. I can <laughs> promise you that. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I'm always good for a line or two. Hey, it's Joel David Moore and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. <laughs>